Okay, so welcome to Agony Orty. This is Hi. like a super special Agony Orty because I've got Steve Silverman with me. Papa Steve. Steve, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. I'm Steve. I'm a writer in San Francisco. I wrote a book called Neurotribes, and I'm very, very honored to be on uh, this podcast. Is that is that the right word for it? You are loved within the community because before we go into some some questions I have later what I think Neurotribes offers us is a bit of an anthology to our ancestry it kind of opens a door to autistic ancestry autistic history identity culture um so I wanted to ask you first of all what was it that drew, drew you to the autistic community to the autistic Neurotype well I'm so glad to hear you say that it that it opens the door to sort of autistic ancestry, because that's exactly what I tried to do. You know, I uh, when I first uh, came across this whole subject of autism, which was back in 2001, when I wrote an article for Wired magazine called The Geek Syndrome, I was approaching it as a science writer. Um, but what really sort of impressed me was the first glimmerings of autistic community even back then. Yeah. And so um, I mentioned this hilarious website uh, in the article, The Geek Syndrome, called the Institute for the Neurologically Typical, mm -hmm. which was, you know, autistic people turning the medicalizing and pathologizing lens around and pathologizing the people who had pathologized them. So uh, what, what it reminded me of was that uh, I'm gay. and when I was in high school, homosexuality was in the DSM as a mental illness, and it was illegal, like it was a crime. Oh, you could in be high school? Oh, my yeah, God. Yeah, when I was in high school. Yeah. yeah. And so when I came out to my parents, they sent me to a therapist for the cure. Do you emphasize with and relate to the way that we've been medicalized? And, and there are those parallels between the autistic community and the gay community the way that you were medicalized or the way that your sexuality was medicalized in your teens and the way that the autistic identity for some, some autistics don't know it can be an identity, Steve. I, I didn't, I didn't. And that's why Neurotribes is so amazing because I, I did listen to the podcast that you did with Dan Harmon and he said it perfectly. He said that Neurotribes is, it's like having someone hold your hand to cross that bridge that, Oh, wow. dividing the community between parents yeah. and autistics and you do you get both perspectives across so well so well thank you thank you so much it's yeah. not an easy feat yeah well you know when i was writing the book it, it may surprise you to discover that when i was writing the book i was terribly anxious because i was afraid that everyone would hate it like i i knew that it, it was unlike any other autism book that had ever been written. I thought that autism clinicians might say, like, what is this guy talking about? Yeah. I thought autistic people like wouldn't like it for whatever reason. Um, I thought that parents wouldn't like it. I thought the anti-vaxxers were going to like back back when I was writing it. The anti-vaxxers were were even more radical than they are now. And we're like dumping pig's blood over the heads of, you know, people who said that vaccines didn't cause autism. Right. And so I was terrified, but it took me a very long time to write. It was supposed to just take me a year and a half, um, but I actually took five, five years. And so my adorable husband had to support us on a school teacher's salary in San Francisco for five years mm -hmm. while I wrote this book. And we were like, eating beans and I was selling my Grateful Dead collector's items at the record store <laughs> to go to the, you know, to go to the supermarket. But um, I was very, very happy when uh, I gave it to a few autistic people to read and they really liked it. Yeah. That turned out to be, you know, I ended up getting a uh, Ally of the Year Award from the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network, which I was very, very honored by. Nothing could make me happier. and the. 
The thing that I want to say, really. Tough community to break, though, Steve, because you can see how much we've been hurt, we're difficult to trust. But the everywhere it's like, oh yeah, Steve, yeah, Papa Steve and Papa Steve. We're calling you That's Papa cute. Steve now. I'm so That's very sorry. cute. Rubbed off. I just um, did a talk in New Jersey to an audience that was, I would say, at least a quarter of the audience was young autistic people, and that's my favorite kind of audience. I actually don't like talking to audiences of all medical professionals. It creeps me out. Mm. But if uh, if there are autistic people there, even though I'm not autistic. I feel like they're kind of my peeps, you know, yeah. like they're, you can, they're the people who I can relate to. You speak our language. Like, honestly, when I read this book, I was like, I love the way he writes. And and another thing I loved was that, yes, I, I really do get to understand the parents' perspective as well, because I do get to see just how heavily medicalized we are, how privileged I am as an mm-hmm. autistic to be able to stand here and speak these words and say these things because it's not safe for everyone to come out as autistic it it simply isn't globally it's just not safe i can't be going come out loud and proud for everyone right it's different so you you do you lend you lend some uh, much needed context and diversity but most of all relatability and identification oh great you give thank you that you give that's not even lending you give it i'm like oh my god <laughs> that's me oh my god oh, that's Frank. and you're good, writing good. about my son and my um, 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 myself and um, not only are you doing that like my son is what you would describe as if you were using the functional labels which you even discuss is problematic he'd be severe because of um uh, verbal difficulties or differences and, mm-hmm. and learning difficulties but look he did this um, just today. He's been copying oh, that's awesome. Japanese, I think. I'm not too sure. I know. Yeah, it looks like Japanese. Yeah. Yeah, and I know he doesn't know the semantics yet, but he also does <laughs> loads of logos. Oh, that's great. Logos and that's great. You give much needed dialogue. You make it less exhausting for the autistic person. I now refer you, people to you, <laughs> so. Thank you for doing that. How does it feel then to see the autistic community using your book to advance their own autistic pride and autistic identity narrative? Well, that's that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to, you know, I very much appreciated that the autistic pride movement was built by autistic people from the ground up. And... What I want to try to be of assistance by providing history that most people would not have had time to dig up, mm-hmm. basically. I mean, most most of my autistic friends are struggling day to day just to access basic services or health care or uh, food or rent or, you know, all that. And so nobody, you know, in a sense, I knew it was a privilege that I, even though I went had to go broke doing it. I knew it was a privilege that, you know, I had like a publisher, for instance. Yeah. So I thought, well, you know, I'll use this time to do for autistic people what many of them might not have time to do Mm -hmm. because they're so busy coping with their day to day needs and their, you know, poverty and um, health issues. Some too fearful as well to speak out as well, you know, sometimes having that existing narrative, having um, you need human examples. Sometimes I always like, well, like chicks, I say to my husband, I say identification is as easy as breathing. You do it as naturally as breathing. You do it as automatically. Humans are like chicks. When chicks pop out, they'll identify. They want to identify and autistics want so strongly to identify and what you point out is that that identification has always been there but we don't yet have a stake or a claim to it and and it's kind of painful in a way to see characters on tv and you can say hey they're autistic but no one's saying it and innovations and creations that are autistic and no one's saying it You're, you're saying it yeah. Oh, you're you're staking the claim in there, and that is setting foundations for then for us to then go. Well, hey, what else is there for us yeah. to, to start equating with autistic 
innovation and creation and yeah you know now i, I want to i have a question for you actually Ooh. <laughs> um, as 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 the autistic mom of an autistic child how do you feel when you hear uh neurotypical parents say oh well you know people like you are not like my child oh yeah my child severely disabled how, how do you feel about that oh my love it's so it used to make me so angry and sad. It now doesn't affect me because I understand where it's coming from. It's coming from, it usually comes from people like, oh, my cousin who's six is nothing like you. And it's like, but that, that's because you're comparing a child to an adult. Now, the autistic community would never judge predominant neurotypes or neurotypical neurology, normal people, would never judge your functioning of a child to an adult so we don't right. really expect it to be given back to us and i don't it's not logical to me that people yeah. would do that um yeah. it's also unfair it dispowers us um you don't know the journey that we've been on no one can see right. the scars that are all up my arm if i've got like a nice dinosaur jumper on one day but yeah. we've got personal trauma and stigma which you more than anyone understand um and it is a fight. There's a divide within the community. It's a parent autistic divide, adult autistic divide, but it's the functioning labels as well. It's creating this argument of you're too mild, you're not severe enough. And it's it's so harmful. It's um it, I, I get it weekly from from people who who pop by and I can hear and they see a snippet of of, of a talk, you know, but it's it's difficult. it's difficult. Yeah, they don't understand the masking of autism. Maybe they're just at the beginning of their child's journey. But what they can do is they can choose the right side of fear. They're fearing the autism itself, when they should be fearing the things that stigmatize us and harm us. Because that's yeah. what they're fearing: the kid yeah. not being independent, the kid's going to be bullied. If we get rid of the autism, everything will be better. That's that curing narrative, which you so beautifully. Right illustrate it's so horribly horrible but you you go there and it's so needed and you bring up the curing issue which emma lomaine has been campaigning of five years constantly so she's amazing i, I just want to say emma good work <laughs> yes and thank she's you amazing. thank you yeah. that will mean everything to her honestly thank yeah. you so yeah. much this is from a a follower did you expect such a huge welcome from the autistic community? Did you expect, because I mean, you said you didn't, you were nervous about us. Yeah, I, did, I didn't expect a huge welcome from anybody. You know, I, I knew that it was a, I knew that it was an unusual book. And, you know, now in retrospect, it's like people can say, oh yes, it was a groundbreaking book. Yes. Believe me, when I was sitting in this chair, writing it for five years, you know, I, I, I had terrible habits i was i was still smoking cigarettes I, i've never been in that in public uh, i just quit last december thank god well but done. So i would be standing out you know behind my back door smoking cigarettes in my robe at like five in the morning like for years oh my god you, know, you sound like book. me you and, sound like me at the moment <laughs> yeah yeah and so i uh i mean it really wrecked my health after a while but mm. i i just didn't think anybody would like it really so you weren't and aware so that you were was, making history yeah i know i did but you never know it like most people who are making history don't realize it at the time no. sometimes you do sometimes you do yeah you know uh yeah i mean yeah it's exciting i mean i mean the one thing that i will say is that at least i feel like i didn't totally waste my life <laughs> you know? like, I actually like did something you know worth you know, remembering or something like that. You are. And, I, and the book will outlive me. You know, like I, I can, yeah. It, yeah, the book will outlive me. And I hope it liberates people in future generations. Yes, absolutely. Because one thing, like, yes, you're making history because you've, like I said, you lend us an insight into our own ancestry. Because what I talked, I talked about the medical narrative the other day. Um, when I was in hospital, Steve, I had a traumatic experience. I, I often get security called on me. I'm like this little frail five foot three woman who's very ill. I dislocate easily. I get security called on me all year round for accessing care for Ehlers Danlos syndrome. And it's because of my tone, my facial expression, things that I'm not aware of, um, rude, um, aggressive. I never swear anything like that. And um, 
you really, when it happened again last month, when I was in absolute agony and they were withholding my meds, I was looking at your face. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you let me know I'm not alone. And I wrote this, I put, your book is getting me through a traumatic time in hospital. Discrimination, gaslighting, ableism, autistic denial, neurotypical lying and bullying and medical neglect. And I've um, got perplexed um, cervix, unknown severe abdo pain, dislocated shoulders, and I'm in a lot of fear and doubt. I want the future medical attitude towards autistics to change. It would be a huge cornerstone as they control so much of the narrative about our autistic identity today. And I've put to you, thank you for giving some of that narrative back to us. If we can change some of the medical dialogue that surrounds autism, the rest will follow in public media and social rhetoric as it will drip down. And you basically, you've laid the foundations, I think. You've strengthened it. You've strengthened it for us to make that challenge. And I cried all over it, and I just got all teardrops <laughs> all over it. Oh, that's excellent. Because, that's great. you know, I was so terrified in there. And you were writing about experiences from, like, the early 1900s, from the 30s, the 70s. And I've experienced that on and off all my life and yeah that's yeah, why yeah. your book resonates with so many people there is a point to this i was going to say because of that history you you trace us all the way back that's the thing you go back to bedlam so we're talking hundreds of years ago people think oh autism's a natural oh it's a, this phenomenon that's just popped up out of nowhere and it's an epidemic oh gosh oh where is it this this awful disease and you 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 do strengthen that counter argument for us with neurotribes um so thank you well you know one of the one of the things that uh you know i quote the american celebrity jenny mccarthy is saying there were no autistic adults in the past it's all now i really wanted to fight that erasure <laughs> of the past yeah and you know parents organizations sort of locked onto the word epidemic because it sounds really important Mm -hmm. And it's like, oh, my God, it's an epidemic. We have to do something. Mm -hmm. And, you know, after decades of being ignored, um, that might have seemed like a good deal. But it was like a deal with the devil mm -hmm. because it rendered previous generations of autistic people invisible. Oh, my goodness, you beauty. Sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I was about to say to you, um, I, I was saying the medical narrative in, in terms of what it does it has made us invisible, not only to ourselves, because many autistics are like, does this belong to me? Am I allowed to have this? Um, you know, they need that validation almost. But it also renders us invisible to each other because we don't know ourselves out, outside of this set of you're abnormal, restrictive, obsessive. And what you do is you spin it. You spin it the way I like to and say, no, that obsessive, repetitive, restrictive behavior actually in my opinion, because he's playing with the marbles, right? Well, you can tap into elementary physics with that. It's motion, acceleration, you know, and you, you do that. Um, and, and that kind of lends me on to autistic and nerd and geek culture, I think is intrinsically based on us, if not by us, which you go there. But I do want to talk about some of the threats and barriers and issues that we are facing still today that you are still that are from the past. So you mentioned the eugenics movement obviously started in America in 1921 and um, before moving over to Nazi Germany, right? Before they right. Took up and the I, it was very important to me that I point out, you know, a lot of people think Nazis invented eugenics. We invented it and then exported it to them. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we were sterilizing people en masse, you know, in, in uh, mental institutions. And we weren't sending them to the gas chambers, but, no. you know, it was, it was life worse than death, practically, mm -hmm. for many people in institutions. Like, we shouldn't congratulate ourselves too much for not being Nazis, mm -hmm. because we were doing terrible things to autistic people and, and, you know, people with many other kinds of disabilities. And even now, you know, there's something that I call soft eugenics, which is like, Silicon Valley entrepreneurs saying like, you know, well, with my gene scanning technique, we could rid humanity of plagues like autism. You know, have it's you, eugenics. Have you it's seen eugenics. Warwick University's recent research? 
They were on the uh, BBC no, BBC One News with um, Autistica, the head of Autistica. Um, yeah. And the lady, she didn't realise that he was autistic. And she yeah. um, was saying, oh, this, this research that we're doing, I think it was an association with Spark. Um, oh, yeah. Basically looking at the gene for the diseased yeah. child. This is oh, literally, did she say that? yeah, she said it literally a month ago on TV. Oh. Autism is oh, the wow. diseased child, the abnormal child compared to the normal child. And basically, we're, we're, we're seeing this history repeating itself uh, yeah. in terms of threats. Um, yeah. It, yeah. And, you know, I just read a um, statement by a geneticist in Iceland who said that, um, you know, Down syndrome is is basically gone from Iceland because everybody aborts their babies if the babies have Down syndrome. And, you know, we're losing a lot of valuable humans, mm -hmm. you know, to to the to the uh, impulse to rid the gene pool. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and this is the thing, this soft eugenics with Warwick University. I'd love to speak to them in the future of what they're doing. It is it, it's. If, uh, many autistics are concerned that the medical future is being paved for us that we do not want in that this idea of we the curing narrative people think oh it's harmless this curing narrative i just want to cure my child of this the curing narrative is leading and is funding this kind of research in my opinion and right well i also think you know i also think that the that the the narrative of curing autism obscures or even interferes with the funding of research into really dealing with medical problems that autistic people have. Yes. I'll, I'll give you an example. The leading cause of death, you know, so you can get no more serious than that. The leading cause of death for autistic adults is epileptic seizures. Yes. Has there ever been a study of how seizure controlling drugs work in the autistic brain. No, there has not. Mm -hmm. There's been hundreds of millions of dollars of research into genetic risk factors for autism. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that research is totally useless or anything, but there are many problems that could be addressed more specifically that would help autistic people lead happier, healthier, and safer lives, Absolutely. but they get ignored because all the money goes into curing autism or preventing autism. Absolutely. And I said, I said like uh, the other day, I was like, why would anyone want to fix the problems or health conditions that inherently affect an autistic community or a community that they view as broken? And we go right. on this Victorian model of ableism still. Like you're able-bodied, yeah. therefore you're valuable. You can speak, right. therefore you're valuable. And yeah. it's still, it, within Britain, definitely, I, it's, so, it's so rife. But yeah. I was going to ask about the um, new the New York Times article about Hans Asperger that came out by Edith Sheffer. I think it was last month. You you do talk about Asperger's because Asperger's in terms of the criteria was removed a few years ago, and a lot of people were up in arms because that was many people's identity as well. But not a lot of people knew much about him, and you do you do offer an insight into him. Could you tell me a little bit more about your reaction to that article that came? Yeah, out? sure. Um, I have known that this was coming for a long time, and, and what just happened is that a guy named Herwig Check uh, published a paper uh, that provides evidence that Asperger himself was much more culpable in uh, Nazi crimes and even child euthanasia mm -hmm. than historians knew. Mm -hmm. And then Edith Sheffer is coming out with a book in May that makes the same point uh, using sort of overlapping sets of evidence. Mm -hmm. I, I think that it's really important to note how a clinician like Asperger could, as Edith Sheffer puts it, drift into complicity with the Nazis. One of the things that I'm proud of in my book is that I located it Asperger in the infrastructure of Nazi medicine in a way that had never been done before. And very crucially, I talked about the role of the Jewish clinicians, George Frankel and Annie Weiss, mm -hmm. in his clinic uh, before 1938, who helped him develop the model of autism that was so broad and, you know, anticipated the spectrum and was much more compassionate than mm -hmm. Um, uh, Leo Connor's model, really. Mm -hmm. But um, what I didn't know 
was exactly how complicit Asperger was. And so now the world is going to know this. But it's difficult it's because problems, there's been though. transcription has to be involved. I mean, a lot of people don't realize that his, arc, his work was kind of archived. It had to be transcribed. And it's only accessible to a few. So you had to really dig deep to get into Asperger. Well, it's, 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 it's even more than that because what it was was that everybody thought these records were lost. Right. And then her check, like, I assume that they had been lost when the clinic was bombed by us, by yeah. the Allies. Um, but Herwig Check found them in the Municipal Archives in Vienna, for which he deserves credit. Mm-hmm. The problem is that particularly Edith Sheffer's book um, sort of brushes over the contributions of Asperger's Jewish colleagues and makes it seem as if Asperger only said negative things about autistic people. Absolutely. And, I saw and, that. And, and, and not only that, it, she admits that, you know, he said some positive things. But she calls them, quote, tacked on and no. points out that, you know, high functioning people, quote unquote, uh, were acceptable to Nazi society mm-hmm. because they needed everyone to work. Mm-hmm. So what she basically says is that Asperger said all this mean stuff. And then if he ever said anything nice, that was Nazi, too. Mm-hmm. I think that's really wrong because I believe from reading the papers produced by George Frankel and Annie Weiss, before they had to leave uh, Austria to be saved from the Holocaust by Leo Connor, like for decades, everybody thought that the nearly simultaneous discovery of autism by Hans Asperger and Leo Connor was a coincidence, Mm -hmm. considered one of the great coincidences of 20th century medicine. So I figured out that it was not a coincidence at all Mm -hmm. that Leo Connor was working with two of Asperger's closest associates when he, quote, unquote, discovered autism. Uh-huh. Um, and I believe that Frankel and Weiss very much informed Leo Connor's uh, view of autism as well, except Connor ended up coming up with a much more narrow and restrictive definition of autism. Parent blame. Kept the diagnosis rates really low, uh-huh. so everybody thought that autism was really rare until Lorna Wing opened it up again after reading Asperger's paper, and then Andrew Wakefield came along to say it was an epidemic. Uh-huh. but. Um, What I think is really important is remembering that there were other people in Asperger's clinic that played key roles in coming up with the view of autism that was expressed in Asperger's paper other than Asperger. Mm -hmm. So no matter what Asperger was doing quietly, and I, I personally don't think he was purely evil or certainly not purely good. I think he was willing to do evil in order to maintain his position at the clinic. Mm -hmm. And one thing that both Sheffer and and, uh, Czech say is that they have no way of knowing how many children Asperger saved by using his position. But that's not going to be the headline this week. The headline this week is going to be Asperger was a Nazi. Even though Asperger was not a Nazi and that he, he never joined the Nazi party, although almost all of his uh, bosses did, Mm -hmm. and certainly a huge mentor at the uh, University of Vienna Hospital, Michael Hamburger, who I talk about a lot Mm -hmm. in Neurotron. He was one of the biggest Nazis in Austria. Mm -hmm. Uh, Another thing that's crucial that Czech mentions in his paper is... Is this after... Meta... Sorry, the Molecular Autism? Journal of Molecular Autism. It's Simon Baron Cohen's uh, Ah. journal. Okay. Yep. And the reason why I was one of the peer reviewers of Czech's paper and the reason why I agreed to do it was because I was, you know, literally one of the best people for the job Uh I had done, you know, so I thought I could do an ethical job of peer reviewing it. Um, And, you know, I I do think that this kind of research is valuable, but I also think it's going to it has the potential to cause a lot of harm and hurt. To autistic people who have been calling themselves Aspies yes. with a sense of pride. Yes. We should not allow autistic people to be ashamed for calling themselves Aspies. Absolutely. I was, this is why I was, I was, I don't want you to think that I'm having a go at you bringing this up at all or taking size. I know it's because yeah. it, it does have wider implications in terms of what she's essentially, she's having a go at Lorna Wing <laughs> and saying, yeah, no, it's true. Was essential to do and, this. And, 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 you know, some, the, one of the most outrageous misstatements in Sheffer's book. I mean, I, let me just say, I admire Sheffer's book for 
painting the landscape of Nazi medicine so thoroughly. She deserves major props for that. But at the end of the book, she says, ultimately, Lorna Wing regretted using Asperger's work yes. to change the face of autism. Mm, that's so no, no. wrong. Mm-hmm. That's wrong. I interviewed Lorna right before she died. She considered the broadening of, of autism into a spectrum and the invention of the Asperger's syndrome diagnosis to be the two crowning achievements of her career. What a discredit, so that, then. What right, a discredit that's very then. wrong. And where that comes from, Sheffer says, is that she is a 13-year-old son who's autistic, but who, quote, unquote, chafes against the label of autism. I think they're, you know, to be kind, I think they're early in their journey mm-hmm. of accepting the autism, you mm-hmm, know. Mm-hmm. And hopefully someday her son, instead of saying, as he's quoted in the book as saying, autism is not real. We all have issues. He says that. Mm-hmm. It's just 13. Hopefully someday he will not only believe that autism is real, but that that's his community. Yes. And that he needs to draw strength, inspiration, and support from that community. Yes, yes, definitely. And I and I wanted to just say in the book, I, I want people to go and get this. Honestly, I, I, I've been so pleased. So many people are like, yeah, yeah, got my copy of Noah Chaps, got my Papa Steve in the house and sending me pictures of your book. And people are loving it. I just wanted to read out a quote of how you describe us because... Too often people see what you're saying. I don't want to be autistic and to be autistic is bad and this and the other. You talk about echolalia, yeah? And people go, it's annoying and it's this and the other. Echolalia is um, a communication technique that autistics will use um, and by, by mirroring, by literally parroting or echoing what you're saying. And um, some will do it more excessively than others. And I, I admit, it can look a little bit strange if you don't know what's going on. My son does it all the time. And, and you describe it as this. You describe it as um, echolalia, uh, the term of art for the way that, uh, sorry, the term of art for the way that autistic people sample the speech they hear around them and repurpose it for their own use. And I put, ah, oh, Steve, and a heart. <laughs> <laughs> that's wonderful thanks so much now, yeah no I, I, I actually remember writing that sentence and being happy about the, how unpathologizing it was so beautiful and that's how I want people because I'm doing a talk at Swansea University my first ever public oh, well. speech as Agony Ortiz in t- front of 290 people so I'm like eh. and I'm talking about stimming about embracing stimming and realizing that there's potential within stimming and using that kind of poetic language that you're using, it is important to, like you said, have it unpatholo- ha- unpathologized. I can't say it. That's not even unpathologized. Yeah, that's the word. Exactly. How, how, how's it going so far? Are you, are you okay? It's good. Yeah? It's fun. Yeah. This yeah, is yeah. Great. This now, is now great. while we're doing this, tell me, like, I didn't, when I first saw the name Agony Autie, I thought, yeah, that sounds rather dreary or so you know but, but then i remember that there's a phrase in the england agony slow, ante, yeah. right? yes that's so it. what is an agony ante in england the agony ant is basically um when i was younger in your magazines you have agony ant and you write in go dear agony ant i my boyfriend won't talk to me or my friends are bullying me what should i do right. and it's right. like you should do this and they're giving advice and right, it's, right, right. and, and it's that's basically what it is and you can have ones who are professional you can have ones that do it from different things. And it yeah. was supposed to be just basically appropriating it for my own use, which is kind of cheeky. It's, it's <laughs> hilarious. It's hilarious. I like it a lot. Thank you yeah, so once much. Once I realized that you were in saying, like, autism is agony. Oh, you God. know, like, that's what I feared. You know? Absolutely not. But do you know what, how it works for me, though, Steve? It works because the agony part is my earliest dam loss because I have right. a lot of pain with that, but never right, the right. autistic. And and that's why I get to talk about that for some autistic, our primary healthcare needs, it's not the autism. It's right. my hypermobility. It's my epilepsy. Yeah. It's my yeah. generalized anxiety that no one is giving me any coping strategies because you're telling me that my coping strategies are abnormal and weird. Right. That's why you need to embrace stimming. Like you said, it's our coping yeah. mechanism. So, yeah, one yeah. more question for you. Um, sure. Thank you so much for this. Sure. I'm so excited. People are going to love it. They've been so excited.
excited to to hear what you have to say. (laughs) Do you know how flattered we are to have, you know how flattered we are to have someone put the microscope on us, because you really did, put the microscope on us and and, and it not be medicalizing, not be negative in the way that you have. That was like not even flattered. Like I'm, it's like he's done this one. Like, oh my yes, thank you so much. <laughs> thank um, you, thank you. So this is from a follower, Brent Williams. Yeah. The Brent Williams the second is his name. Excellent, very, very fancy. He asks, yes. "What changes have you seen within the autistic community? Um, what do you like? So, so since writing your tribe, since." immersing yourself in the autistic community what changes have you seen which ones do you like and what do you think needs improvement okay um big one. one of the things that makes me super happy is that there are college neurodiversity groups opening up all over the world and so now when i go to a campus to give a talk i often meet privately like you know after the talk or before the talk with a neurodiversity student group. And not everyone in these groups is autistic. Some of them are are dyslexic or Mm -hmm. or diagnosed with ADHD. But these groups are so important because they offer the possibility of peer mentoring for young autistic people. And also they just have that exciting juice in them of like, you know, that I remember from like the early days of gay liberation. You know, like, no, we're not, we're not sick. We're brave, you know, yeah. and uh, so uh, that is really exciting to see neurodiversity and empowerment take off on college campuses. Mm-hmm. That's really wonderful, and especially online, diverse? online as well, right? Yeah. Because yeah, on, like you said, absolutely. you said the deaf community, sign language for the deaf community, the way that it yeah. enabled them to communicate is it, it's been you made parallels with the internet, which you basically say we created. Thank you. <laughs> Holla, holla, holla. Sorry, I get that excited that you actually put that down for us. So it's like, yay. Um, but I've completely forgotten what I was saying. Oh, no, I've put out that happened. Go on. What do you think needs improving? <laughs> well, you know, I, let me preface this by saying that I feel awkward, you know, as a neurotypical, uh, making any, you know, comments like, well, you guys should really improve. The one thing I, w- you're I would rah, I, you're rah. <laughs> I will say a cautionary message. Sometimes I think young, young autistic radicals are slightly unkind to some of the pioneers of the, of the movement. So it's like, I understand the criticisms of Temple Grandin. I, I understand that she's white, that she's, you know, privileged, mm-hmm. that the only reason why she... That's why I say I all the time, I'm privileged, I'm privileged, because you get it a lot. Yeah. Right. I understand all those criticisms. Yeah. But... I'm very glad that the gay liberation movement did, didn't constantly eat its elders so much. Wow. You know, it's like we tried to, we understood that our, you know, older people in the movement were not always hip to whatever the latest insights were in the right. community. Right. But I think we were a little more forgiving of, uh, you know, some limited perspectives on the part of the elders because they went first. Yeah. They had to deal with it first. They had to be very brave. And so, you know, I, I think that people like Temple Grandin uh, should be revered as, or at least thanked, as elder pioneers of the movement. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I know that there's a little too much focus on her, and I would rather have young autistic advocates like you um, be be giving talks and whatnot. Um, oh, but- that's the style come in time. I don't mind sharing. I think it's important to have that dual dialogue because there's still autistic adults in their 60s, the 50s, 70s, still finding out they're autistic. It's still yeah, oh, I know, I know. So we I need just, to- I just, uh, I'll tell you a hilarious story. I just saw a, a guy uh, at this talk that I gave who was not diagnosed until I think his 50s or so. And, uh, and I asked him, I said, what did people think you were before you got a diagnosis? Mm. And he said, an engineer. <laughs> <laughs> You know that I was only diagnosed when I was 27. I'm 31. Oh, wow. I'm 31. Oh, wow. And like I was born in 86. And I say to people, oh. look, if you're, a, if you're a girl, especially, you're not getting that diagnosis unless right. you've got verbal communication difficulties, 
not getting that diagnosis before 2008, 2010, yeah. Yeah. in my opinion. Like, it's just not happening. And I just want to thank you. I want to end it by thanking you because... I'm going to end it. This is a bit strange. I've got a tattoo of Doctor Who on my arm of a TARDIS. Oh, awesome. I'll quickly Excellent. show you. I may as well show you. they quick. My horrible hypermobile arms and horrible hypermobile skin. One second. I don't know if you can see. There we go. Oh, that's great. The TARDIS, yeah? Awesome. Yay. It says you'll dream. Oh, that's so great. It says that's you'll, awesome. you'll dream about that bot, but bot is a euphemism for. So now it's like I'll dream about that all the time on my arms like damn it sorry you didn't think it through because you know we like to play with puns and usually yeah. every word will have lots of different meanings and that's why communication yeah. is so difficult i don't know which meaning you want anyway right. so i wanted to end with with doctor who i did not know i was autistic um i tried reading about it when i was 15 i was drawn to raymond from the age of like 10 there's something about him even though i'm completely different on the spectrum in terms of my presentation mm -hmm which is completely normal, as we know, as you paint. It's normal to have that diversity within the autistic Yeah. Community. But I was drawn repeatedly to autism, and I fell in love with Doctor Who in 2010 when I was going through a really traumatic time. And it was Matt Smith's representation at the time, and I saw me, uh, the way he moved, the way he listened, but, but not really paying attention, then looking away, and then just skipping off halfway through a conversation, and then picking things up, taking a lick or a bite and then throwing it away. I was like, that's me. So yeah. why, why am I, I didn't think so openly, why do I identify with an alien? But I wanted yeah. to thank you because what your book illustrates is that we've always been there. Yeah. We are there. We are weaved so, we are woven so deeply within culture, within social structures and narratives deeply more than anyone knows and you really yeah. do you open that door to it for me and everyone should read this this is a must read when they say you need to read this to understand autism they're not lying <laughs> great great thank you so much i really appreciate it i'm very honored to be here and um hello to everyone out there as well watching and I just want to point out to the community that you, you know, you've chosen to come and speak to us first about some really important issues. Because I think, you know, that what what Edith Schaffer are saying about Asperger's and the, the wider implications that can have upon people with Asperger's identities. It also, yeah. by the way, it tries to narrow the spectrum down again to a Kena kind of thing in terms of it's trying to say or imply that. The, the spectrum was only widened because of a Schindler list kind of right. uh, ideal because yeah. it's trying to save. So damaging because there's people who are trying to fight for diagnoses. And like you said, they'll go, you're too mild and you shouldn't be diagnosed anyway. It will be used right. to weaponize us. So I wanted to point out to the community that you've, you've come here first to, to re well, I know a few other people, but you've come to the autistic community first to, to air your concerns and talk to us. And I know that that will mean a lot to us because these things do hurt us. They, they, they're they difficult to process. And knowing that we have an ally like you by our side mm. means everything. So we, I thank you on behalf of the autistic community. Well, thank you so much. I'm deeply <laughs> grateful to you as well. <laughs> All right, right, take care. Welcome. Thank you so See much. You. Thank you. Thank you.